dignity. There's no place for corruption and greed. Our land must be shared by all Guyanese. Don't make nobody fool you. Don't make nobody use you. Don't make nobody deceive you, distract you, restrict you, derail you, or bully you. Guyana, take heed. No place for greed. Some tech we want, put it in the pocket. We got to stop it. Tongue on me knees for Guyana. Say a prayer for Guyana. Dedicate some, you know, time to them. So many things happening. Good evening and welcome to Plain Talk. Thank you very much for joining me over the next hour. My name is Christopher Ram, and I'd just like to point out to begin the program that yesterday, Tuesday, March 8th, was International Women's Day, and I'd like to extend programs greetings and best wishes to all our women folk and of course to wish them the kind of equality and sharing of the benefits of our society to which they are undoubtedly entitled we still know that women's suffer disproportionately perhaps compared with men they have some of the biggest social challenges they do some of the lowest jobs in society they tend to be largely unorganized and because they don't they're not as organized they're not uh, formally employed in many cases questions of pensions and other social benefits really does affect them. I'm hoping that next week we will have the opportunity to discuss with a group of women the question of International Women's Day and especially the issue of women in Ghana. Let me start our program, and as you can see on the screen there, the role of civil society in a democracy. It's been a rather interesting past few days where the has been there was has been serious clash between the government right up to the level of the president, President Ali, members of his cabinet taking civil society to task for statements that they have put out and in attacking the members, President Ali sought to define what civil society can and cannot do. He said civil society cannot be convenient. Um, they must that they're run by individuals or are not open to the wider membership of our country. They cannot be the conscience of truth of the or the conscience of society when they are convenient in the way they address issues. Let me leave it to my friends and the two guests this evening, Norris Witter, on my immediate left, um, and Mr. Yog Mahadio. I should say that Norris Witter was one of the, he heads one of the unions, or a union, that was involved in the statement that provoked the kind of reaction from the government. Mr. Dr. Yog Mahadio is himself very much active in civil society in the 
recently formed group called Article 13, which takes its name from the Constitution. And the Constitution in that article seeks to promote an inclusionary democracy in which persons have a right to participate in the decision-making processes affecting their economic, social, and other well-being. Gentlemen, welcome to Blendo. Uh, thank you for having me, Chris. And uh, good night to the viewing public. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Good to be here. I want to ask you, let's, let's try to see if we can get some kind of understanding as to what is meant by civil society and whether by its very nature civil society and the government at any time are on something of a collision course. It's an open question. It's a, it may appear to be a very um, simple uh, question dissolving of a simple answer. But in Guyana, very few things are simple, even if they are simple. Mm -hmm. um, what I would wish you is to do some, is a little historical perspective. Sure. I wonder how many of us can recall the name of an organization The Guyana Action for Reform and Democracy. In brief, GARD. GARD was uh, a conglomeration of many civil society groups. Trade unions, faith-based organizations, members of uh, the Bar Association, and one can go on and on. It is that that group was founded by, among other persons, Yusuf Pusad and the Bishop George. You also had the GHRE involved in that group, uh, too. I recall a time during the struggle of that civil society conglomerate that all the opposition parties at that time, including the People's Progressive Party, embraced Guard. And through Guard's instrumentality was uh, realized for some over a number of years, the first free, fair, and transparent election, which saw the PUP assuming um, office. It must be noted also that it was God that threw up the then mm -hmm. Prime Minister, Sam Hines. Yes. Sam Hines. Right. So it boggles the mind that. Uh, this civil society grouping that was once the lover of the party that currently constitutes the government today is being seen as a pariah, as the worst thing that could possibly happen. I want no. to. I wish to pause here for yeah. the time. Thank you. you, know, you can, can you can you explain that? Maybe can you try? <laughs> well, why, why that is so? Chris, um, all of these civil society, most of them, or if not all, all of these organizations. Let's go back to not too far, not as far as Norris takes us back. A couple of years ago, 2019, right? 2018. These 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 organizations were embraced by the current government then opposition and so it's amazing that the consistent in in my view for example many of us 
our message has been consistent. We have been speaking against corruption regardless who's in power. We have been speaking on calling for good governance regardless of who's running the government. We have been always focusing on the independence of the judiciary. We have been always looking at the, the empowerment of the wider society. So to use the words uh, uh, convenience uh, or convenient organizations, you know, it's, is itself a very convenient <laughs> explanation of, of President Ali. And I would want to, to ask um, that the, the PAC, um, I would want to ask that, you know, if we can go back to the beginning of, of the PPP's uh, existence in Guyana, um, look at how it started. It started as a, as a civil society. Look at how things moved. How many groupings started as this, and you move on, you graduate. But more than that, Chris, I wanted to say that when we look at Guyana's rating internationally, you look at how we, we, we compare with other countries for, on the corruption index. You go to Freedom House, um, which is freedomhouse.org, um, which evaluates how freedoms are being uh, uh, you know, experienced in various countries. Where matters of governance, where matters of, of expression and freedom and civil society concern, we are not doing well. And it speaks to, there must be something we are doing that probably irks somebody somewhere. But rather than deal with the message, the messengers get attacked. And it harkens back to, to the 1970s. It harkens back to the, the, the British rule. It harkens back and it, it's a dangerous signal um, that something is not right when people start to become attacked and start to become vilified for expressing their thoughts. Chris, I just want to take 30 seconds more to, to explain, to, to share this thought. If, let us just imagine there is a hypothetical country. It's not Guyana I'm talking about. There is a hypothetical country. Let us just, for example, say it is the United States. And the United States has the office of, of the second vice president or third vice president or prime minister, whatever it is in that country, runs a media outfit that creates fake news and creates uh, attack, attacks on civil society. And then Kamala Harris's office, the vice president's office of the United States, shares that and shares it to groups and individuals and, and, and other tax-paying individuals who then shares it further. Then you have a, the, the President Biden would come out and say, well, well, you know, these things that coming out from our offices, we, they, they won't admit are true, but those things coming out from those people calling for truth, reconciliation, democracy, no corruption and stuff like that, that's bad. And the last thing I want to say, sorry to be so long-winded <laughs> on it, Every time you come out and you say something about governance, calling for good governance, somehow or the other people are now saying, well, if you want to represent people, go and, and, and contest the elections. That's not what my constitution entitles me to. My constitution entitles me to a freedom, to associate, to express, and within the law, to do whatever I can do for myself and people in this country. And thus, Article 13, <laughs> which I'm part of. Well, the, the, you, you touched on the point about this, this uh, go and get votes, go and form yourself with a political party. That removes you from being civil society Correct. by definition. Mm. Civil society is that part of society that are independent of the state, voluntary, and at least to some extent, self-generating and self-reliant. Um, anyway. Um, now you you mentioned guard. Some of us do remember going on on, on the weekday afternoon at the parade ground. Nigel Hughes was very prominent then as well. Um, Electoral Assistance Bureau was another mm. key organization. Clay Clay McLeod. McLeod, yeah. yeah. Um, we tend to forget Albert Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. These are important names. Um, that have contributed to the democracy which return. Now, Ralph Ramkaran in his column on the, in the Stabacuse over the weekend, his column is called Conversation Trade, 
and he suggested he I, I don't know which recent fiasco he was talking about um, he probably was talking about this exchange between the, the, the groups um, the statements that they issued and the reaction by the government and he said the recent fiasco demonstrates that some parts of civil society have lost their way, are unfocused, and are floundering. Do you accept that criticism of civil society? Um, my response, Chris, to be very brief. Uh, it seems to me as though, I mean, uh, Antonio Troll Ralph is someone who I have had the greatest of respect for. I still respect him, right? Um, he has had wide experience as a politician. He has been in the practice of law for a, a number of um, years. But I somehow, when I read his article, it seemed to me as though Ralph has lost his way. Now, one has to look at the function of civil society within context. And my brother Yaga, in his opening remarks, made a reference to good governance. The question that should be asked is whether the political directorate, those who have the responsibility to manage this state embraces the concept of good governance, which speaks to the old question of accountability, transparency, openness, respect for the rule of law, etc. Now, if they do embrace the concept of good governance, then there should be no concern or worry about an active civil society because all civil society does is to monitor, evaluate, and where necessary, critique the government to ensure that not only that universal, universal principles, norms, and values are adhered to, but the whole question of good governance is respected. Now, now, which sensible government, unless it's a government who deliberately has decided that it's going to do wrong things, and therefore it does not want any organization, any group, right, to critique it based on its excesses. Now, as you rightly said, civil society by definition suggests that this body is merely a watchdog body with no aspiration of seeking political power. Hmm? So it, it begs the question as to whether, and you know, just bear with me a little. In 1993, a mere year after Dr. Cherry Jagan acceded the office as president, he visited Washington, the Carter Center, and he pleaded with President Carter to assist Guyana in developing a national development strategy. The first draft of that strategy was completed in 1996. However, when the document was evaluated, it was found to be one thing of civil society participation. 
and as a consequence, it was not presented to Parliament. Unfortunately, Dr. Jagan died in 1997. Do you know that in 1998, arising out of consultation between the then finance minister, Dr. Jagdew, and the Carter, Carter Center, it was agreed that the draft will be reviewed with the contribution of civil society. Over 200 professionals and a plethora of civil society groups participated in the finalization of that draft in 1998. Yeah, but and it was presented in Parliament. At that time, it was all well and good, right, to have civil society participation and assistance, right? But you know why I want to suspect that civil society probably was reluctantly embraced because Guyana was in a deep financial crisis and there was a desperation for the ac access of loans to take Guyana out of the rut that it's in, right? But, but are you being fair here or are you, you you're pursuing um, a parallel agenda? The president if an Ali is not saying is not discrediting the importance of civil society in fact he says my government and the PPPC government believe strongly that civil society has an important role to play in any democratic society and Ralph Ramkaran himself as well although I thought he, he, he said they can play a major role in improving Guyanese lives, not in the, only in areas of transparency and accountability, other areas not having as much sex appeal, and in which the government can play a major facilitating role. So neither of them is denying the role of civil society, but they're saying, as Ralph Ram Koran seeks to be doing, he's telling civil society that they should limit their roles to their self-determined mandate or face the accusation that their groups are a cover for political activity. How do you interpret that, Mr. Dr. Mahadeo? Mm -hmm. I, look, Senior Counsel Ralph, I, I think, you know, he has expressed, as you rightly said, he, you know, in arriving at his conclusion, he, he addressed both sides of it. And we all agree, civil society has a role civil society certainly has something to, some important role to play. I think the, the critical thing, Chris, going back to what President Ali said as well and what you just quoted, government must not only see civil society's usefulness when it, uh, when it echoes their tune. Successive governments of this country has unfortunately only seen those groupings as important that can embrace their messaging. So as long as any group would step up and step out that doesn't agree or that would seek to ask publicly for clarity on anything, they are not being responsible according to the government of the day and stuff like that. My thing is that the, whatever it is that has irked the government of Guyana, that has come out from civil society, address those things point by point rather than starting to say well this is well civil society organizations are no good let us get a calendar of of items raised a list of items raised and let us get them addressed we ourselves from from article 13 we have raised a number of things um, we have raised things from from procurement and and, and uh, commission to integrity commission we have raised a number of things we have also raised uh, our, our questions about uh, post-election matters. Um, all of these things, they're important. And a government of the day, they are not going to be focusing on these things. They have, you know, according to the president himself, they have to deliver on their manifesto. Again, from civil society perspective or from my personal perspective, the manifesto is now convenient because you're going to deliver what suits you when. So civil society has an important role to play. We are, we can be the bridge between what the population is, what the pol politicians say their manifestos are, 
and what is being delivered. All the ambits, all the sectors of, of society has an important role to play. Trade union, say, uh, civil society groups, all of them, they all have a role to play and they must be accommodated. Unfortunately, Chris, while the president has used those words there, I wish to humbly, humbly point out that using those words almost seeks to, to redefine um, what a civil society organization must be or should be based on who they, who, who's being liked or not liked. Well, our senior counselor Quran seems to be taking similar kind of position, which I find a little unfortunate. There are several other professional organizations in existence which generally confine themselves to their mandated areas. So are you, are you locked in right. to a particular area? Is that what um, you you I, 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 mean? I, I you find cannot, it, I find if, unless you're a trade unionist, you cannot talk I, about a minimum wage, or unless you're an environmentalist, you cannot talk about um, the the environment. But but Chris, the notion of uh, good governance, it is not every citizen's business. Huh? It is not limited to politicians. It's everybody's business, right? The rule of law affects everyone, right? Accountability affects everyone. Transparency, openness affects everyone, right? So I, I, it's difficult for me to really understand what really um, Senior Council, rather, what is the message that he's trying to convey? Very, very difficult. The, it, what I, the, the thing is that um, the state, any, any um, operative of the state, should be happy to know that there are persons within the society that uh, is uh, brave enough or has the courage right, on doing their analysis and their monitoring and evaluation to say to the, to critique the state and say, look, we think you're not doing right here, you're not doing wrong here, right? Okay, everything is okay on this hand, right? Because what it does, it helps the state you know, in properly managing, it helps the, um, the, 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 the political directorate direct to do its own self-appraisal, its own interrogation, hopefully. And if it is found that what the society organized is, is true, to take the necessary corrective action, right? But what is it? It is that uh, these... Uh, um, state operatives want you to be in sync with whatever they say. You must be compliant with them. Right? And therefore to express a point of view or to take a position that differs with theirs, no matter how right that position is, is to be an enemy of the state. True. <laughs> Chris, when uh, in the six months of the election impasse, as I, I like to call it, um, 2020, that, you know, that period of time from March 2020 to August, all those people who were speaking out, me, you, me, there are so many others, people we brought uh, on programs that were from State Department in the U.S., pri prime ministers of various countries, uh, these persons were not active politicians. They were all coming from civil groups, coming from various backgrounds to support what they saw as a democratic call for good elections and good governance of those elections. And, you know, it is sad that the convenience uh, is actually being used because it is inconvenient for a government. These same groups, when we were speaking out that the APNO AFC's good life was only being enjoyed by a few, well, then you were embraced. But now when you're speaking out that the good life is now still being enjoyed by only a few, well, now it's, 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 a, it's a problem. So I would like to reiterate that deal with issues. Deal with the issues that the civil society is raising. Chris, in parliament, there are two, part, two main parties, and there is a joint party seat there. But how is it? that the PPP would have such uh, vigorous, uh, vehement position on the PNC and what they say, 
but would have to accede to the request in Parliament. Yes, it is because it is the national institution set up to do that. But civil society doesn't seem to have a place if it's not singing the chorus of a government. It can't continue like that. Well, is not the, the definition of civil society is that the organized groups and institutions that are independent of the state, they're voluntary, and at least to some extent self-generating and self-reliant. That's what Correct. A civil society ought to be. Correct. Um, now, but, but Chris, can I just interrupt for by one? By all means. Here, here is another thought that, that we need to assess. We, I am from civil society grouping. Um, government of Guyana, issued a statement within the last three weeks or a month in which they spoke their disagreement of Russia's uh, military maneuvers against Ukraine. Not a government body came out other than the message from the government. Not any of the civil society groupings that the government embraced spoke about it. But the independent civil society groupings like us, we came out. We came out in support of the government's call for peace and peaceful resolution. Well, it was consistent, not in support of. You know, well, yeah, it was consistent. Thank you. But it, it was one of those instances where it was. And, you know, somehow or the other, the message seems to be missing because this one may have been convenient. This one may have been okay, but the rest weren't. Now, What should be the characteristics of a civil, to constitute part of that civil society? What should be some of the characteristics? You're, you're of course, by its very name, civil, suggests so some level of mutual respect for others, the views of others. Um, society, it means you're drawn from the society. Um, Perhaps you should share some of the values of that society? Well, one is that uh, the, 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 the group is independent, right? It does not dance to the tune of any um, political party. It has no political um, aspiration, right? And uh, it seeks to execute its um, function honestly and um, objectively, right? Uh, without any bias for any, uh, you know, not pol any political um, structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I may add, um, Chris, you know, we, we, we would have said this before, you know, it, it's, it's a commitment. A civil society grouping makes a commitment by forming itself into a civil society group. And, you know, Ralph may have a point there as well, too. If you can't m upkeep these commitments made, then maybe you need to re-examine yourself. A commitment to secure inclusionary uh, democracy yourself with the people of the country, to ensure a better future for all. And, you know, working in collaboration with private and public sector. It's, it's not done alone, it is working with, we have been speaking to ministers of government. Many of the things we bring out is, is after consultation with people within and outside of government. You know, talking with members of the legislature, talking with Guyanese at home and abroad, advocating for good governance. I mean, I want to just share this. We said, I mean, at Article 13 launch, we said our group has been created to ensure that the people of Guyana respect, are respected and heard at all levels in debating Guyana's development and achieving a thriving and sustaining su sustainable society. Our objectives include advocating for good, transparent, accountable, responsible governance, as well as identifying and proposing solutions with advance, which advance our country and our people. So our constitution gives us the freedom, right? Um, you started the program by, you know, in introducing that we are f I'm from Article 13 grouping. That's what it allows us to do. I would want to push this further, Chris, uh, Chris that if we, we are now heading into the PPP's mi midterms in office, as we are heading towards another elections, 
civil society has a very important role to play now. And what's that role? With regards to the upcoming elections. The two, the two main parties in Parliament, in the National Assembly, are the direct beneficiaries. The only people who are not beneficiaries are the, the non-elected civil society groupings who can look like what we did before, call it for what we see it, and advocate for a free and transparent process that the winner must get sworn in. Without civil society, all of these values would be lost. The, we go back to Ralph Frank and um, President Ali. President Ali is saying that um, you, in addressing issues, you can't be convenient. Um, Ralph Ram Quran is saying that you should address issues only that are um, mm -hmm. determinative, determinative of your own mandate. Is that a contradiction? It is. It is a contradiction. Look, it was uh, agreed and accepted during the development of the National Development uh, Strategy, and also the Poverty Reduction Strategy uh, document. That, uh, and I'm saying this was, a, this was a, a consensus from the World Bank, IMF, and the, politi the political actors at the time, mm -hmm. who were from the PP, right? That uh, for any developmental strategy to be effective, to achieve its desired results, it is imperative that one, that uh, civil society participates in the development of such a strategy. Right? And that civil society also ensures that the strategy is executed as intended. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it plays an obligation on civil society not only to assist or to participate in the development of the strategy, but to monitor, to evaluate, yeah, to assess, and wherever it finds necessary to critique, to do so. Right. So, so, so I cannot understand why it is today that what was embraced then, then is being seen now as some bad woman. And I can add another example, Chris, um, a very vivid one, as a matter of fact. Look, the two major parties in the National Assembly, they signed, cr they created, signed, and got us into a, an oil contract that I think every man, woman, and child agrees could, could have been better, could be better. The current government in opposition and going up to the elections had promised to revise and relook at those contracts and renegotiate. The two parties, main parties in Parliament, they're silent on these contracts. If it were not for civil society to raise these things up in public sector, where would we be? Everybody would be quiet. It took civil society many different, in many different ways to raise these things and let people know and to remind the government this was an election promise. Now we are hearing, I mean, you're hearing about sanctity of contract. Right? So the stumbles that persons have been making along the pathway were convenient for political expediency. But suddenly it, 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 it is not important for this nation to address these things. And we have, Guyana is going to um, discover and find more and our natural resources have been um, not been exploited in the past and it will be hugely exploited now. Um, whether the safeguards are there to quote you, whether the guardrails of democracy will be pre prevail. Um, is something that civil society has to now do because those in power, that's all they're, they're, they're focused on, retaining power. But you see, the attack on civil society should not be taken lightly. Whenever the political directorate becomes intolerant of views 
that are not in consonant with these. It is the it sets the stage for the creation of an authoritarian state. We have had this experience before. The question, you know, that I wish to ask is that we have some civil society groups that are speaking out against what they consider to be wrong things in the society. And they are being condemned for doing so. I now ask, does they, does who criticize us, those who criticize us, can they bring forth, bring forth their civil society group to comment on the things that the current civil society group that is visible have been commenting on? Where are their civil society groups? Because, Chris, in your opening remarks, you, ex you um, expressed or you extended greetings to our women folks in society. And I want to concord with the sentiments that you've expressed. But at the same time, express the hope that they should that there will be no more dildo language in our honorable house. Right? I would have expected right that those who okay. Okay. I, pa I pause. You pause. Um, I want to go back to Rafram Karan. He says in this column of his, hence the recent political criticisms against the government by a group of largely unknown bodies, some of which have already withdrawn their sponsorship of the statement, which appear to have been organized for the purpose, fell flat. Now, Mr. Witter, you are, this is a serious accusation um, that, look, here you are making political criticisms against the government. And I'm not holding you um, solely responsible for um, this statement, but, uh, you know, you had community-based rehabilitation might very well have been, as Ralph Ram Koran said, one of these opportunistic my word, not his, but that's what he meant. Um, East Coast Development Committee, um, maybe I don't know which other ones. Um, how many? How many of these bodies have, in fact, withdrawn their sponsorship of the statement? As far as I'm aware, none has. Right? Didn't the they, National Two Sheriffs Council? They did. The National Two Sheriffs Council did not withdraw. The, the, um, the, the, um, the forum. Let's get together. Yes, the, the forum. Uh, the forum, uh, uh, release, uh, sent a release clearly indicating that uh, the inclusion of the National Tuition Council um, name on the um, on the list was an, was inadvertently abstained. In relation to the Orsaline um, sisters, I think that um, there was some misunderstanding, mm -hmm. but eventually the Orsaline sisters came out clearly with a statement that they did emphatically endorse the statement. So I think that um, uh, senior council um, statement was uh, premature. Probably had he waited <laughs> for those releases and the, um, and the comment that came subsequently from the Orsaline sisters, he may not have written what you have, what, what you wrote. You know, uh, again, looking at what Dr. Ali, President Ali said, um, but, but, Ram Koran, mm. um, one talks of a political nature, statement of a political nature. Um, that's Dr. Ali, 
and Ralph Ramkran talks about political criticisms against the government. That, that's not helpful to civil society for a prominent person like Ralph Ramkran to come out making statements like these. Um, and should, should he be responded to? After all, he is a responsible voice in our society. Um, you know, I'm becoming even the more you <laughs> you read <laughs> Ralph Sam's, the more I'm becoming concerned about um, this goodly gentleman. And uh, as I said earlier, I'm wondering whether he is losing or he's already lost his way. I'm worried about him. I'm worried of him. Something seems to be wrong. That is not the um, that is not the Ralph Ram Crown I knew. Well, hmm? he is the one who wrote this. <laughs> it seems more like Alzheimer's to me. I would I would ask you to take that back. I, I really, <laughs> I, I'm very okay, sympathetic. You know, I, I, I take it back. I take I'm it very back. sympathetic yeah. to Alzheimer's. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Yes. Chris, I, I, look, Senior Counsel Ralph is, is due for his opinion. He has his opinion and he has stated it. Um, and uh, President Ali has had his say, and his say, according to what he said there, represents his entire government and his entire party. Um, it is up to civil society to really continue uh, doing what they believe in and to continue being what they uh, plan to be mm. and to ensure that they continue asking for good governance, continue being a voice against corruption, continue being a voice against crime and all of those things. Now, civil society, and let's keep this for the next few moments and focus. We talk about civil society. Um, there should be independent of the state, voluntaries, um, self-reliant, self-generating, they must go depending on handouts. Should civil society groups be politically aligned? I don't think so. Um, you say they, they should be? No, they, they should not. Political alignment compromises the independence and the neutrality of civil society organization. And I think that is one of the problems we have. They are, and that is why many so-called civil society organizations are silent at particular point in time. You will find that some will be silent now, and there were some who were silent during the reign of the last regime. And why that silence? That silence is due to their alignment to those political parties. Right? Mm -hmm. But Yog, isn't, isn't the role of civil society, and this is a statement um, which was made some years ago, what, what civil society should be doing in a democratic society. Is it not the role of civil society to watch and comment and hold accountable how state officials use their powers? Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. Civil society is the only uh, voice that is unbiased. And, and going back to the question you asked, Norris, no, they should not align themselves with, with any political party. But Ralph Ramkaran thinks that that is being political. Civil society is the only voice. Uh, Chris, 2014, 2013, thereabouts, uh, you know, when the then President Ramatar was being told, you have corruption in government, he keeps saying, show me the proof, show me the proof. The proof came at the election time, right? Same, the same thing happened at up to AFC. Without civil society, we would not have gotten where we were. The Burnham's 26 years, the, then there was, you know, there's so many things throughout our history that thankfully civil society kept on going. Now I must say this, Chris, uh, you know, I, it's my duty to, me, I, Yogmada, I don't agree that some of the civil society groupings themselves were uh, horribly silent during, during the election impasse. They didn't have an opinion. To, to speak out about what was happening and some took the side 
of, of, um, of the government, then government, or, or, or the, the, the then beneficiary of, of a rig that I, I, I have called publicly, it was an attempt to rig the elections. Now, do they, should they be, sh should they be shut down because they, they um, did not come in? Did not, right. Well, why are you having you shut, shut on the PNC then? If they were the big bad wolf, then something is wrong with this picture. The people have, everybody has a right under this, under this constitution, our constitution, to ensure that no government tramples on the constitution. Granger himself had commented, Chris, I think it's a famous, it's one of my things that I've stored away. Granger had said of Donald Ramatar, the president is sleepwalking into a constitutional nightmare. And guess who ended up sleepwalking into a constitutional nightmare? It was Granger himself. No. We got to be the watchdogs for these things. We got to look out for it. We got to raise it and, and hold the politicians accountable. And as you said too, to ensure that power is not being abused. Look, it is so easy. And I, I, if I were a betting man, I would bet you. You would see state vehicles, state apparatus, state finance, state everything coming big as we get one year before elections. Because Guyana has never seriously addressed campaign financing, never seriously. And I would like to ask Senior Council Rock and other people in civil society, this is something we must advocate for. Well, you know, <laughs> I don't like going after people, but he was on GCOM and they never did anything about e campaign expenses. But let's go back to um, the functions of so civil society. Isn't it part of civil society to expose the conduct, including corruption, um, self-enrichment, promoting their own people, conduct of public officials, and to lobby for good governance reforms? Is not what civil society? Absolutely. No. Def definitely. Definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Chris, the, the, it goes without saying. Look, civil society has a view. I'm not going to comment on it now, maybe at another program we can. Civil society, by and large, has a view on the chairman of the tender board that the government oppose, is opposed to. Now, the government has its own appointees. If it weren't for civil society, Chris, would this country have known that with the way the NRF was passed, the act, that the government was withdrawing or had the right to withdraw 100% of the oil revenues that we would have earned up to now? These are things that would not have come up because, unfortunately, the oppo opposition still seem to be asleep. You know, but there are certain critical things that are not coming out. The public is not being aware of these things because we are just coddling to politicians all the time. The, 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 the whole question, again, of civil society, um, the, and we saw that significantly in the the infamous five months civil society organizations have a vital role to play in monitoring the conduct of elections absolutely these are basic non-negotiable functions of civil society and and you know if if you're going to be accused of being political do this and let anyone dare you to be mm -hmm. yeah but the thing about it Chris, is that um, who, whoever accuses civil society of being political? I think about define what is meant by being political. Okay? Civil society expressing a view on a matter <laughs> that affects the people within society. Is that political? And particularly mm -hmm. if it's the government. Right. Civil society expressing a view to positively influence a political direction. Is that being political? I, I think the question of being political needs to be, it needs to, who will make, ever make the statement, needs to define what exactly they mean. Well, Are we talking about partisan politics, in terms of party politics, in that sense of being political? Or are we talking about influencing policies in the interest of, 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 uh, of the And citizenry? that is where the word political comes from. It's it derives from policies. So, gentlemen, I, I, I think we, 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 the clock will be running us down yeah. in a short while. What's happening in Ukraine? 
I know both of you have, been, have played prominent roles in, um, in, in protesting outside of the Russian embassy. The, Russia is, it, it is not really at war, it has invaded. The Ukrainians are resisting. I don't consider that a war. Russia is waging a, a, a war on the people. It has invaded them. Today we read that they have bombed um, a hospital. You know, some people are going to say, oh, that's propaganda, that's fake news. What, what has motivated, motivated you guys to go there? Uh, Chris? And Norris, you've done an excellent job in promoting, getting your people, mobilizing your people. Let me, let me immediately um, it's, it's acknowledge a, it's that. It's not only an issue that every citizen of Ghana ought to be concerned about, but every citizen of the world. Because if there are two global or potential global catastrophe that is tearing us in the face of the moment, one is climate change and the other one is the possibility of a nuclear catastrophe. And uh, one can only imagine if there is to be some nuclear exchange, what is likely to happen? You know what motivated you? I have always abhorred violence. Um, you know, so my my main motivation was was you know coming out against uh, the invasion itself and also a care for Guyana because we are at risk. We're at great risk because if any, any madman decide that they want to just upset the apple cart a little bit, uh, we don't have an answer. And Chris, um, regardless of how we may say the, the, the roles or the rules or the people in democracy work, it obviously failed in Ukraine-Russia um, arrangement. Um, here are people who had a, the Minsk Accord, a peace treaty so many years ago, post-2014 coup that now, you know, you have an invasion to assert, according to Putin, to assert that uh, his place, that NATO can't um, get closer. Well, he kept his, his, um, his reasons and rationale mm -hmm. kept evolving all Shifting, the time. Yes, yes. So, so, Chris, I mean, my thing is that in, I'm going to quote a, a, a gentleman that I respect very much. He said in this 22nd year of the 21st century, we can't be resorting to war. And this gentleman that I'm quoting is Chris Fram. Well, well let's, um, go, <laughs> let's go on. I, I want to raise another point. Um, you will recall that when we met mm -hmm. uh, the, the Russian emissaries, the question of Venezuela came up. Mm -hmm. We did put that question directly to them. And I, I, I acknowledge publicly the willingness of the Russians to invite us in mm -hmm. and to hear our point of view. We sometimes don't get that from our own people. They did say that they would not support um, any Ru uh, any Venezuelan action to against Ghana. Mm -hmm. Things have changed. Mm -hmm. Venezuela, American Venezuela seems to have got closer again, which would put Russia somewhat at a distance. Correct. How do you read that? I am not reading into it presently. I'm just seeing that it's it's the the everybody's shifting the goalposts. It's. Uh, the court president Ali is convenient for <laughs> well, I America to get there. Mm -hmm. But I would just want to say this, Chris, 2014 uh, post-coup in Ukraine, you couldn't have looked down the road and see that you were going to get this invasion today. Yeah. We can't see that America han having a handshake with Venezuela. Uh, by the way, what happened to the deposed president? Uh, you know, there were supposed to be two presidents mm -hmm. there and yeah, stuff yeah. like that, right? But uh, look, the, the truth is, I can't foresee down the road that this this amicable relationship that started is will, will last. Uh, what I do know is that it it is good for Guyana that that has happened. I think it is extremely good for Guyana that's happened. Well, I, I can only quote um, uh, Kissinger, uh, Chris. America does not have any uh, prominent enemies or prominent um, friends. Yeah, permanent, permanent interest. interest. <laughs> and in this case, the permanent interest appears to have been oil. Correct. Now, that, of course, has a different implication Absolutely. for Ghana. Definitely. Venezuela has the largest Proven. resources, yes. proven Proven resources mm -hmm. in the world. It can shift the needle of prices mm -hmm. Absolutely. at a whim. Absolutely. And we're just taking baby steps here as yet. 
So. Okay, the operators are signaling me. <laughs> Mr. Norris Witter, Dr. Yog Mahalio, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. For appearing on Plain Talk, um, role of civil society and in a democracy. I'm sure we're going to continue these discussions thank in you. the weeks and months ahead. Thank so, you. So, operators and viewers, thank you. Good night and see you next week.